During the Apollo 11 mission, astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took the famous first steps on the moon, while the third astronaut, Michael Collins, stayed in the command module Columbia, which orbited around the moon before picking up Buzz and Neil and flying back to Earth. In the 48 minutes that Columbia was on the far side of the moon, facing away from Earth, Collins lost all radio contact with all other humans. He was, for those 48 minutes, the most lonely a human has ever been before. Imagine if you were there, sitting in a small spacecraft, knowing that you're 384,000 kilometers away from civilization, with no contact to any humans whatsoever. Now imagine that times 1.7 trillion, probably much, much more. That's XO-1, an interplanetary exploration game released in 2021. Before we move on, if you're interested in abstract, emotional, vibey experiences and beautiful planets, buy the game first, I'd say it's worth the price. A quick summary of the story and my interpretation. There was a mission on Jupiter with a flyer in Jupiter's atmosphere and an orbiter. You were the commander, waiting in the orbiter. There was some accident in the flyer, leading to the death of all other crew members. You return to Earth, alone, and hours after returning, Earth receives an alien signal with plans to build a new spaceship, the XO-1. You claim that the signal was meant for you, but whoever's in charge doesn't allow you to steer it because of your mental state. Someone else pilots it, and the ship fails to launch. You say that is because the ship could only work with you as the pilot. An informant tells you that they keep it in a hangar in the desert, so you steal it and you make your way through the different planets, which is the gameplay throughout which you have memories of the past events. At the end, an orange light creates a space-time singularity, which you use to travel back in time to when the disaster happened. Your arrival somehow enables the crew to evacuate, so everyone survives. You stay on Jupiter in XO-1 and your fate is undecided. Now, going back to my point about loneliness and Michael Collins. Imagine you're hurtling through planets that humanity cannot even hope to reach before the heat death of the universe alone in an unimaginably great sense of the word. How do you write music for an experience like that? Riss Lindsay, the composer for X01, has a simple response. Use a guitar. The choice of guitar here is excellent. Not only does it create the typical lo-fi hip-hop beats vibes, perfect for a vibey and actionless game like this, but it acts throughout the soundtrack as a symbol for the protagonist, being the only traditional instrument among a crowd of electronic synths. Let's think for a moment about the meaning of the acoustic guitar in our culture. It's not artistic or virtuoso like the violin, it's not cliché or sentimental like the piano, it's not majestic like the cello or optimistic like the flute, the guitar is very down-to-earth, it's what you play around campfires, little simple tunes that kept people going in hard times. The space probe Voyager 1 has a gold-plated record, for any extraterrestrials that might find it, where the song symbolizing loneliness, Dark Was the Night, Cold Was the Ground by Blind Willie Johnson, features only a guitar and humming. So now let's go through XO1's soundtrack, track by track, and discover how it's designed to fit the story. And trust me, there is a lot to discover. Starting with Dead Metal, the menu music. You'll notice here a recurring theme, which is that the guitar plays a single short ostinato and the synths add color to the piece. The effect that this creates is that the only thing that changes is the environment, the alien world. The human spirit has a single quest, a single emotion throughout the piece. Importantly, the guitar is played by an actual human, which is clear from the random dynamics and sometimes missed notes. Titles are also an important factor, as I discussed in this video. Dead metal brings to mind the alien structures or XO-1 itself, which are presumably made of metal. It makes me wonder whether the signal itself or whatever created these structures could be considered alive in the first place, or if it was just alien cosmic magic stuff. 
I also like the interpretation that connotes metal with the music genre, that this is what dead metal music sounds like. Maybe the pilot used to listen to metal? Anyway, we're moving on to the first planet, Sagan 4, named after astronomer Carl Sagan. The only dialogue that was revealed thus far tells us that the commander thinks they can get the dead crew back to life, that the signal was received and how Exo-1 works, standard stuff for getting new players into the story. The music, Yesterday, starts out with very reverby synths in the Lydian mode, the brightest one of the seven diatonic modes. raising C to C-sharp, making it sound even brighter. This makes it especially fitting for a calm beginning, while remaining alien with the use of electronic instruments. This glissando and the following note, which sounds sharper than should in 12-tone equal temperament, Invoke, to me, the image of a sunrise, along with the bright scales used, although it could be just because it's used in a sunrise at the end of the game. Talking about the symbolical meaning of the word yesterday, one could link it to the commander feeling like the accident happened only yesterday, clouded by their grief, or it could be referring to the more out-there concepts about time loops and such, which is the explanation I prefer. It also has a strong link to the next track in the album, Yesterdays, which I'll discuss when we get to the final planet. For now, we move on to Noe, which has completely different music, although still using only synths. Its expanding consists mainly of this rising passage played by a vocal sounding synth. This makes me think it's a symbol of the commander's awe at the planet, like they're inwardly saying, whoa. Through the tunnel probably refers to when the track plays in game, that is when the player goes through the slit in a metal structure, and it's pretty much just that, accompaniment. I feel this is because Noe as a whole is just an experience of awe at the alien world the commander is exploring. The dialogue preceding it just says that Jupiter Orbiter is approaching orbit, and then enigmatic lines from the commander about how they don't need physical space in Exo 1 to command it, and that quote, it does more than just fly. This plays nicely with the sudden increase in alien structures, blue glow aesthetic, and weird fireflies. The newness of the experience and of the beginning has worn off after the first planet, and now we can just enjoy the views. After all this synth work, suddenly the guitar kicks back in, in Strange Flyer, playing a motif that I'm calling the Hope theme. I'll get back to it later, for now it's clouded by synths near the end. The Hope theme returns immediately after, in Reflect, on Queerness 2. Again, the guitar is clouded by synths, this time a repeating hit sound. Followed by these strongly muffled guitar chords. Slowing down the action and again bringing a Wanderer vibe as Jupiter Flyer previously comments on flying through Jupiter's atmosphere. I noticed that throughout the game, the feelings of the commander in-game coincide with the feelings they had felt at the original time of the cutscenes. And I believe this has a lore-related reason. The arrival on Nautica stirs the movement of meteors from orbit around the planet, leading to a meteor shower. This track also lacks guitar, instead opting for this screaming synth. Along with the recent cutscene where the fire in Jupiter flyer starts, 
and we're left with a cliffhanger as to the fate of the crew. This creates a feeling of instability and chaos, especially when the whole planet is one big ocean, there's nothing you can land on, and the structure of the ocean is constantly changing due to the meteors. Over time, the environment gets darker, reflecting the darkening feelings of the commander in Jupiter Orbiter. At first it was just panic, and now foreboding sets in. At the end, the monolith, which is what you use to travel from planet to planet, is struck by a falling meteor, just as Jupiter Flyer presumably explodes. The second part of Nautica follows the memory of the commander returning to Earth and the alien signal being received, and we get this soothing guitar tune in a sunset. <laughs> I think it represents the commander's journey back to Earth, calming down after the events on Jupiter, with a bit of stable ground for XO-1 to rest on. Eventually we get a gliding synth. interesting, and what you can probably pick out even though you don't know why, is that first note. It's a minor sixth. A bit of theory. Usually when you want to make a piece of music sound cool or abstract or vibey, use this hexatonic scale, a minor scale without the sixth. You can also raise the sixth to make a Dorian scale, which sounds just as cool. A lowered sixth in this track reminds you that the scale is minor. So while it does fit, it kind of clashes with your expectations and suddenly turns from lo-fi hip-hop beats to a requiem in its own way. This represents the grief that undoubtedly struck the commander during their return to Earth. You can also note how the sliding sound of the synth and the echo contribute to make it feel like an outcry in pain. It's also preceded by this kind of broken noise. The effect is that it's almost like a surge of anger or emotionlessness before the scream. You can listen to the piece in its entirety. It's really a unique way to represent someone in grief, without any words or cliché sad piano chords. We move on to Daramulum, an Earth-like planet with trees, bushes and lakes. All around us is especially calm, featuring only a guitar and these really reverby synths. Presumably, after hearing about the signal, the commander immediately thought of the Jupiter mission and how the crew could be saved. They calm down and see new hope, as the flat sixth is missing. Then we have Coronidas, an asteroid flying around a star, definitely the strangest level in the game, featuring weak spherical gravity where you can just drift off from one asteroid to another. The slowness and open space here, I think, resembles a lack of action and waiting for XO-1 to be built so that the commander can save the crew. The music One Way Trip features very long and echoey drones in a mixolydian scale. Then the first signs of doubt and foreboding creep in with, again, a flattened sixth. could be a minor third and A major, but I prefer the symbolical meaning of the repeated minor sixth. As we move on to Sojournus 23, XO-1 loses most of its abilities due to a magnetic field, just as the commander becomes powerless. They have been informed that they are not allowed to pilot XO-1. 
The short tune accompanying this planet, Red Ocean, features similar wailing synths to a sunset back on Nautica. This time, there is this repeating B down to E mini-motif, repeated three times. Also note the extra long pauses between sections, leaving the listener waiting for the next part. It reminds me of long pauses between sobs, or pauses between thinking and realization. At this point, it might be good to mention the role of silence, or ambience, in X01. Music usually isn't playing non-stop, and you're just listening to the sounds of the wind and the ship rolling on a surface. It reminds me of Balance, a simple ball rolling game from 2004 that I made my first video essay on. And I realized that the two games are strikingly similar. Both feature spherical protagonists, both have occasional electronic ambient music with lots of silence, both tell abstract stories. Even though it's possible to derive concrete meaning from XO1's dialogue, most players will just experience the emotions. Darwin 3 is a breathtakingly beautiful planet for me, featuring a turquoise ocean and these huge metal cubes with vegetation on them. Very similar to a scene I described in And the Waves Go By, which came from a dream. But the music here tells a different story. Monolith, we only have synths, alternating between hopeful sounding chords and ominous sounding ones. The ominousness is thanks to a sharpened seventh, which creates a melodic minor scale. This represents the unease and foreboding that the commander feels at XO1's launch. They know that it will only work with them as the commander, but maybe they are wrong? They are trying to stay hopeful, despite their instincts telling them it will fail. I think this also has implications about the commander's current thoughts, flying on Darwin 3. Despite the world's beautiful appearance, they are still completely alien, devoid of civilization and ultimately hostile. The unease resolves at a peak of hopelessness at OBS 3, a cold, mountainous, windy wasteland. As you enter this planet and a reporter says that the launch has failed, this is what you hear. Try saying that doesn't make you feel cold and alone to the most extreme scale possible, to such a scale that you can't even hope to imagine it. How did Riss manage to make me cry just like that? The Heights starts with an E-flat ostinato on the guitar. It's worth noting that this is the only note the guitar plays throughout the track. It's almost as if the commander is unable to feel anything at all, is locked in a state of paralysis from the disappointment. There's a very soft, low synth melody being played at the same time, and its simplicity completely baffles me. All we have is a repeated tonic, E flat, then a sharpened sixth, C natural, before going down to the flattened sixth. A recurring theme, it seems. I think it's the first C natural that sounds so fake, out of place. Discord it even. Then, when we drop to that painful C flat, we're reminded that this piece is in minor, 
It's like a wicked variation of the grief melody from A Sunset. Although I really don't know why it feels discordant in this piece in particular, as opposed to sounding cool as it should imply a Dorian scale. I'm guessing it has something to do with the mixing and instrumentation, maybe some musicians can help me out in the comments. Then we get the soft high melody, which again ends with a flattened sixth. There's also this return to the tonic halfway through, which still doesn't feel like a proper resolution because of the sudden income of that darn C natural in the bass. This piece is so mysterious to me because it seems simple on paper, but I still don't know how it manages to be so unbelievably depressing. The commander is miraculously saved from eternal cold loneliness by this random energy thing. And we move on to the final planet. Coelus is the perfect antithesis to Obias III's hopelessness with a ballad of flow, purpose and life. It's a gas giant, so it's completely impossible for the ship to stop moving. First we hear below the clouds, as we are guided by this orange light. At last, the hope theme from before resurfaces. This time, the guitar and theme are audible even after this long, loud, screaming drone. explain how I interpret it and what it represents. The two previous times this theme appeared was when you saw this non-causal object flying around, and as it vanished from your ship's radar, the theme faded out into the synth. Now after OBS 3, it's there and it's permanent. I'm not sure if it's the same thing as this orange light, but from the repetition of the hope theme, I'm assuming that's the case. And if that's the case, then the non-causal object brings you to the monolith and creates the singularity. Therefore, I believe the non-causal object is a representation of the hope the commander has in the alternate timeline, the one where the crew doesn't die. How does it work? Well, it's pretty simple. First we have this double fourth, which to me sounds like eye-opening music. It uses stacked fourths as opposed to stacked fifths, which are more royal or majestic, or stacked thirds, which are, I think, more jazzy and traditional. And then is the same motif, but with a return to the flat seventh. The seventh being a symbol of anticipation. You really want to resolve to that tonic, it's right there. So, this theme is a combination of eye-opening awe and anticipation. And then, at last, we're flying on Coelus, on the climax, waiting to fulfill our purpose and save the crew. In-game, we hear echoes, of which the first 43 seconds is just three guitar chords and some long drones. These are on the 5th, 3rd and 2nd notes of the C-sharp minor scale. The 5th represents a feeling of climax and ascension, while the 3rd and 2nd are hinting at the tonic and thus a resolution. Then we have a change to chords with the tonic and octave higher, a 7th and a 5th. But it doesn't feel like a proper resolution yet, because we finish on that 5th. Rather, it feels to me like a way to resolve from the fifth from above, and it just happens to include the tonic. Sometime later, we have a chord containing the tonic, second and third, but because of a drone playing the fourth, we still don't have a proper resolution, as the tonic now feels like the fifth of a different scale. In fact, we don't resolve at all until the next track. Something approaches, takes the ideas of climax and anticipation from echoes, and takes them even further. The title underlines this. Some abstract idea of an ending and a resolution, 
Something is approaching. Here, one guitar plays the ostinato from Echoes with a clearer rhythm. While another guitar plays the main melody. In particular, we have these two melodies, both starting on the 7th, just one tone away from reaching the tonic. Which seem to play around a bit before settling on that tonic. like the commander enjoying their last moments in another galaxy before ending their quest. Then we switch to a more controlled melody around the tonic, and for quite settling. We again have this fourth, which climbs to the second, the fifth, and falls back down to the second. A nice touch as we switch back to the previous melody is that the second and third are now on the beat, as opposed to the fifth. There's a shift of focus from the climax to the resolution. And, at last, we get a descent into the tonic. I think it's important to note that the guitar plays the main melodies in both of these tracks, the synths only rarely supplement them, the human factor is in full force here. Then the singularity is created, and we hear the oddity. The huge alien synths take over. With the guitar only appearing sporadically. The human's role was essential, but small. The commander is now in new territory. Their duty is fulfilled, now whatever happens happens, and they're just along for the ride. The tonation is also significant here. It's in C Dorian, which is a cool and emotional scale, with the tonic at C the center of the circle of fifths, the tonic of yesterday, and a semitone below the tonic of echoes and something approaches. All this makes it feel grounded, like some cosmological basis, which is very thematically appropriate. And then we see Jupiter again. The accident is playing out, but after the blue beam strikes, the crew safely escape and the credits roll. What confused me when I replayed it is the music as opposed to something approaches, which I had thought would be fitting for the credits, we get a reprise of yesterday. This does make sense, however, not only from a time travel standpoint, but also a thematic one. It reminds me of the time in Ori and the Will of the Wisps, when the theme from the main menu replays once you find Ku, your owl friend, again. It's a reminder of when you first opened the game, just as Ori is reminded of its feelings in the prologue, when it was with Ku. Here is the same idea. As the commander starts flying around on Jupiter, they're reminded of how they felt on Sagan 4. Just careless exploration of the alien world, ignoring any mission, cause or memory. And the player feels the same way. But, after the credits, when we're free to roam around on Jupiter, we also hear Yesterdays, a continuation of the previous track. It contains the same heavy synths, but higher this time, indicating a change. 
There's also no guitar here, and we end on a strange note that feels like a sharp sixth. This makes the player feel alienated once again, along with the frequent tritones. This is perhaps not what a typical player would expect to hear at the end of a game, strong melodies ending on the tonic, but it's exactly what is required thematically and story-wise. The human part of XO1 is gone, the story is finished. Now, it's just the alien world remaining. Also, the title is quite clever. Not only a continuation of yesterday, but also suggesting an infinite time loop. Its position in the soundtrack also suggests that the saving actually happened at the very beginning, which has double timeline implications. Now I'd like to quickly discuss the keys used. Usually I wouldn't be bothered because for me that's a too superficial change that non-musical people would never really notice, but that E flat in the heights caught me off guard. So I estimated the tonations of all tracks and these are my results. On this bar graph the number of sharps in the key signature is a positive value, whereas the number of flats is a negative value. You'll notice there's only one huge negative chasm at the heights, which is appropriate. We have a small peak at the end of Noe, falling down to a valley of depression and grief at the second part of Nautica. Then there's another peak at Coronidas, which falls to a hopeful two sharps for Sojourners 23 and Darwin 3. After the chasm, we rise to an all-time high with four sharps at Coelus, followed by the oddities grounded C Dorian. Now going back to the instrumentation. As I said, the guitar usually plays repetitive melodies or ostinatos, while the synths usually have unique and always changing melodies. I think this is because the synths represent the feelings felt at the time of the events, whereas the guitar represents the feelings of the commander reminding themselves of the events. When remembering a big event, your emotions are usually washed out, less intense compared to the actual event. Going one step further, if we say that the guitar represents the human in X01 and the synths represent the alien world, we can deduce that the entire alien world, all the planets we visited, are a representation of the human's memories. Remember when the stormy sea of Nautica represented the sudden accident in Jupiter Flyer? Remember when the ambient, gravityless Coronidas resembled the actionless waiting of the commander for X01 to be built? Now, I know some of you will think, well, surely the developers didn't intend to put all of these mysterious metaphors in thinking of the story. The truth is, we don't know how much of what I said was intentional, and it frankly doesn't matter. This video was not a demonstration of the genius of Riss Lindsay, although I do think he's a genius, but rather a demonstration of how we can analyze stuff we like to figure out how it works, so we can then use those same principles when making our own stuff to achieve similar effects and also just for the joy of analysis itself. One last point, a retort to the criticism that the storytelling in X01 is foggy and incomprehensible. Indeed, you won't get much of it the first time you play, and some of it is so ambiguous that you could say almost anything about it. But that's extremely fitting to a game about alien worlds. I'll contrast this with the Kickstarter demo of the game. Here we had clear dialogue explaining exactly what happened with X01. And after the wormhole closed, the pilot was never seen again. At the time, scientists had little idea of the workings of wormholes. Science fiction usually depicted them as instantaneous doorways. However, what our unwilling pilot found was exactly the opposite. We have an empirical, understandable, easily digestible story for our human brains. That's not what aliens are. Aliens are, well, alien. They're incomprehensible for us. Strangely enough, the dialogue in X01 could be compared to some sections of the Bible, where you also have stuff that can be interpreted in millions of ways and that sounds unreal and illogical. In both cases, the effect is the same. A sense of mystery, a feeling that you will never understand everything about this work, that it will always remain beyond your grasp. That's what X01 is, a human story in an alien world. Thanks for watching. Thank you.